There are over 6.3 billion human beings in the world, and the number is growing by an average of 90 million every year. Planet Earth affords us the very finest of its resources. In fact, that's why we're now able to enjoy the healthiest and most abundant food we ever have throughout history. However, for nearly three quarters of the world's population, obtaining sufficient sustenance remains an arduous daily challenge, one that doesn't always have a happy ending. Human intelligence now finds itself confronted by one of the most urgent challenges it has ever faced, the need to develop the means of assuring abundant food sources with adequate nutritional value for each and every one of the many species on Earth. The Earth is humanity's support system. It's where we carry out our daily activities. It's where we obtain food, clothing, and shelter. But for how long? At the beginning of the 20th century, there were 1.6 billion people in the world. By 1960, that figure had risen to 3 billion. In other words, in just over 40 years or so, the population had doubled. Evidence shows that it will redouble this century. By the year 2025, there will be some 8 billion mouths to feed. And by 2050, there will be over 10 billion. It's not easy to predict what might be called Earth's load limit, the number of human beings the planet can sustain. But it has been proven that we don't know how to feed 6.3 billion people despite producing as many as 2,700 calories a day for as many as 12 billion individuals. For quite some time now, humanity's management of its food resources has been recognized as decidedly insufficient. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization provides annual detailed reports on the matter. Consider, for example, that for the same cost of producing the 250 grams of meat in this hamburger, 50 people could eat a nutritious plate of cereal. And if this hamburger meat came from a cow in a tropical country, its basic upkeep probably rendered at least five square meters of land essentially useless. There are currently about 1.28 billion cows in the world. Around three quarters of them live in the southern hemisphere, while practically all of the products their owners send to market are eventually consumed in northern industrialized countries. It is a fact, however unpleasant it may seem, that with the cereal products fed to livestock, millions of human beings could satisfy their currently unmet nutritional needs. In short, the lack of food that assails a vast majority of Earth's human population may be the direct consequence of excesses perpetrated by the remaining minority. When we talk about food, there are two basic problems that humanity faces at this point in time. On one hand, there's hunger and the diseases caused by the concomitant lack of basic sustenance. 
On the other hand, we're also seeing an explosion of what might be called luxury diseases. Not only obesity, but bulimia and anorexia as well. So while we're seeing a decreasing trend in hunger, a slow drop to be sure, but a drop all the same, both in absolute and relative terms. Obesity is increasing at a rapid rate and is becoming a major medical issue in communities throughout the world. In fact, some of the so-called luxury diseases are listed as leading causes of death in the developed world. In contrast, somewhere in the world, a person dies every two seconds from malnutrition. Researchers estimate that every human being on Earth could be adequately fed by products cultivated on land the size of South America using modern technology. Currently, we farm about 10% more than that, and many agricultural experts assert we are practically at the limits of the planet's productive land capacity. Towards the end of the 18th century, an English economist named Robert Malthus posited a discouraging theory. He predicted that the Earth's population would increase geometrically, while food production would increase only arithmetically. Those predictions could not have been more dramatic. He calculated that in three centuries' time, about now actually, it would be essentially impossible for 99% of the planet's population to obtain enough food to survive. He was wrong, of course, for despite having an exceptional capacity for deduction, Malthus couldn't possibly imagine the incredible scientific and technological advances that would be applied to agriculture and animal husbandry in the centuries to come. And it is almost certain that science and technology will continue to provide advances in these fields in the future. Near-term nutritional studies are based on a wide range of variables. But there is a consensus on one thing. Economic solutions are a key factor for it does little good to rely on resources that are not available to everyone. Regarding hunger, the technological challenges for the future are the following. Producing more per hectare and producing it in a more environment-friendly fashion. Since right from the beginning, over 10,000 years ago, traditional agriculture has negatively impinged on the world's ecological balance. In fact, early agriculture was more adverse than its modern counterpart, the opposite of what most people think. And there's no doubt that the environmental impact of food production must be understood as a function of each ton produced. Today, we can grow tons of food on less land with lower amounts of fertilizer, less water, and less energy than, say, 30 years ago. But we still haven't significantly improved the relation between production and population growth. If, say, 30 years ago, X amount of the earth were contaminated when you ate, say, a sandwich, today it's only half of that. But the population has doubled. The fact is the environmental impact of agriculture has only gotten worse, not better. At the same time, human health has improved as a result of the development of new food sources. We now understand that eating well does not mean eating a lot or eating exotic products per se. Eating well means maintaining our physical well-being providing the body with the essential nutrients it needs to develop and thrive. The evolution of our understanding of nutrition and food science has provided us with the ability to actually synthesize both animal and plant proteins. Today, we can produce food and nutrients that are not so commonly found in nature. 
But this is only the beginning, for in the near future, advanced preserving technologies coupled with computerized biotechnology will make the creation of personalized foods ubiquitous. Many experts hope that progress in this direction might actually provide effective ways of eliminating undesired obesity and other luxury diseases. By the same measure, improved nutrition for children will not only provide the basic requirements for acceptable physical growth, but also for proper intellectual development and overall physical health. It's widely accepted that in the general sense, forthcoming advances in the field of nutrition will greatly enhance all human activity in the 21st century. This man may very likely have saved more lives than anyone else in the 20th century. His name, Norman Ernest Borlaug. He was born in 1914 on a small farm in Cresco, Iowa, in the United States. He studied agronomy at the University of Minnesota, and after graduating, he designed an innovative scientific procedure that would turn out to be a key reason why Malthus's predictions would not come true. In fact, Borlaug showed the world that it was very possible indeed to feed every person on the planet. The story began in 1942, when Borlaug was chosen to head an agricultural project in Mexico. It so happened that in the early years of the 20th century, wheat exports were a major source of income for Mexico. But around 1910, wheat blight, an especially pernicious fungus, started wreaking havoc on the harvest. That would change once Borlaug took action. In the 40s and 50s, experts in cross-pollination techniques essentially followed a golden rule. All plant varieties of the same type were sown at the same time, in the same type of soil, and under the same climatic conditions in which the finished product would later be harvested. But Borlaug was in a hurry. Wheat blight was ravishing the crops at record speed, and there simply wasn't time for tradition. The rules had to be broken. The techniques that we used, uh, what we call shuttle breeding, selecting in the uh, populations after the crosses, the segregating populations, the best plants under two widely different uh, environmental conditions. For example, planting them in the uh, uh, Yaqui Valley in the state of Sonora when the days were getting shorter, taking the best plants from these populations, with the best grain and shuttling them, transferring them back for growing a second generation each year in the high valleys of central Mexico, in Toluca, when the days are getting a little longer, picking the best plants and moving them back to Sonora. If by so doing, this shuttle breeding, we cut the time to produce a new disease-resistant variety in half compared to what it was uh, that was being used everywhere in the, else in the world. Instead of 10 years, we cut it to four and a half or five. But not only that, Borlaug developed a variety of wheat that was totally resistant to blight and which could be grown in any kind of climate, at any altitude, at any time of the year. This was a strain that grew closer to the ground and had thicker stalks. The harvest proved much more resistant to the effect of both wind and rain, and the seeds generated more stalks and more spikes.
Norman Borlaug's discoveries contributed to the improvement of grain harvests in other parts of the world, too. Many millions of people were saved from starvation, especially in India and Pakistan. In fact, that was the beginning of what later would be called in the 1970s, the Green Revolution. For his far-reaching research, Norman Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970. At this particular moment in history, Norman Borlaug's experiments may be the most important step ever taken on the long road towards eradicating hunger in the world. Despite the Green Revolution, however, there exist a number of ecological abuses that do not easily lend themselves to simple solutions. Many critics cite irreversible damage to the planet's biodiversity and environmental contamination resulting from the prolonged use of fertilizers. There is also another issue of particular complexity. Many environmentalists see Borlaug's work as the beginning of what they consider one of the most potentially dangerous threats facing humanity in the 21st century, genetically modified foods. These fields in Mexico belong to the International Center for the Improvement of Corn and Wheat, known by its Spanish acronym as the CIMIT. This is where the world's most advanced research is carried out on genetically altered grain. Products containing wheat and corn amount to nearly 25% of the total caloric intake consumed in many developing countries. One of the many objectives of the CIMIT is to discover ways to improve the cultivation of these basic foodstuffs through the creation of new varieties that can resist disease, withstand devastating weather conditions, and generally thrive better than their existing this counterparts. Plant, plant that performs like this one in a heavy drought condition when controls are performing more or less like this. And this is not just one plant, this is, I can show you a thousand of other plants that are all performing in the same beautiful way. They are all outstanding for drought. This is an answer that the biotechnology can give in a, in a short way to the world. So the battle lines have been drawn. On one side are those who cannot imagine feeding the planet without putting biotech discoveries to good use. On the other side are staunch defenders of tradition, those who demand agricultural products free of chemical contamination. Genetically modified or biologically pure? That is the question. And as this expert is pointing out, these grains have different properties and characteristics. The problem I have is not whether something is genetically modified or not. It's not whether it's genetically engineered or not. That's not the question. My concern is, under what conditions can we safely apply these techniques in a responsible way, a way that will guarantee the absence of undesirable side effects? Right now, that's not the case, not in my opinion. Milk with extra calcium, decaffeinated coffee from actual coffee beans, eggs with less cholesterol, different colored rice, seedless watermelons. These are all examples of genetically modified products purposely developed from natural varieties that did not possess these characteristics. The procedure is simple enough. 
First, scientists select an organism with a desired characteristic, say, resistance to a specific disease, the ability to survive in one environment or another, or an especially rapid growth rate. It could be a plant, an animal, or a fungus. Then they search for the gene that provides the desired characteristic, extract it, and by one method or another, place it into the receptor species. The last stage of this process is simply encouraging the reproduction of the new variety under rigorous time control parameters. By the mid-20th century, there were some two million hectares of genetically modified crops in the world. Now, there are about 45 million. Actually, the most cultivated genetically modified crop is rapeseed, a plant used to feed cows, which are invariably made into hamburgers. But we should remember that many of these genetically modified species were originally developed in order to make better use of certain herbicides, or the truth be known, to force buyers of the seeds into using herbicides made by the same company that developed the seeds. But all this notwithstanding, there is every indication that the future of world food production will rely to a great extent on genetic engineering. During my lifetime, the world population has grown from 1.6 billion to about 6.1 billion, close to 6.2 billion now, and it will probably be about 8.3 billion by the year 2025. Can we produce the food that will be needed for that number of people? And can we produce that food without destroying our forest and our grazing land? for livestock and our habitat for wild species. I say, yes, we can produce that uh, food that will be needed if we do a proper job of uh, continuing through research to develop better varieties, better cultural practice to fertilize more efficiently. It's obvious that we cannot produce food for 6.3 billion human beings by using traditional agricultural procedures. According to Norman Borlaug's calculations, on the current amount of cultivated land in the world, we could only feed 4 billion using traditional farming methods. We would also need between 5 and 6 billion more cows to produce enough manure to fertilize the soil. In other words, there would have to be two billion less people and over five billion more cows. Not exactly a viable plan for the future of humanity. The lives of the animals we eat might seem peaceful enough, but they're also very boring lives. These animals don't have to look for food or protection from the wind and rain. When they fall sick, they receive treatment, and they don't even have to worry about being eaten by predators, except for human beings, of course. But then again, they spend their days cooped up eating tired, dried feed full of chemicals and they tend to die at a rather young age. Their sex lives are practically nil. And as if that weren't bad enough, they live in pens so cramped that they don't even have space to play or stretch out. 
The fact is, the animals we eat are not happy. And while this may seem strange, it actually has a major influence on the quality of food these animals provide us with. Productive animal husbandry requires a habitat with the appropriate sanitary conditions and proper immunological controls. It is also fundamental to provide sufficient biological security so that infectious agents can't get in. The lack of balance in this area is what causes enormous problems when an infectious disease appears. It might be because the biological protection was inadequate, that is, the farm was unable to keep infectious agents out. But not only hasn't it kept infections out, these infections sometimes spread to other farms. And it isn't just because an infectious agent got in, but because it was allowed to coexist with the livestock under inadequate environmental controls. I believe the balance between these two factors, biological security and proper animal welfare, is what produces better livestock, higher quality products, and greater environmental security. At this stage, we are more than conscious of the fact that we need animal proteins in our diet. However, we are still not able to assert that we won't be victims of future catastrophes, such as the unfortunate outbreak of mad cow disease. And yet, at the same time, we can't afford not to analyze the advantages and disadvantages of the meat we consume, even though we have learned that certain alternatives are, without a shadow of a doubt, much more healthy. Ostrich meat, for example, looks very much like beef. Its taste and texture are similar. It has less cholesterol, less fat, fewer calories, and practically the same protein content. Initiatives such as these may constitute an authentic revolution in the 21st century with respect to our thinking about the raising of livestock and of culinary art and taste in general. Imagine a typical cooking program on TV. The cook presents his ingredients. Oil, parsley finely chopped, salt, pepper, and of course, the crickets. Crickets are insects of the Orthopteron family. They're easy enough to find, and not very expensive at all. So what keeps us from tossing them into the frying pan and giving them that magic touch of parsley, salt, and a dash of pepper? Of course, you have to wait until they're nicely browned, but that doesn't take very long. And then it's dinner time, everyone. Fried crickets, a dish that's probably somewhat repugnant to most of us, but it's actually not that much different, either aesthetically or nutritionally, from an exquisite order of calamari. And while you'd never know it, these crickets are actually healthier than many of the foods we consider nothing short of irresistible. They're practically vegetarian insects. Their meat provides high protein content, is low in cholesterol, and it won't make you fat. Besides that, it's inexpensive, abundant, and easy to find. And as far as taste goes, well, the truth is it's kind of like chicken. Wild crickets constitute just one of the 1,462 edible insect species registered to date. Many of them are familiar enough, for they've been part of the human food experience since man first appeared on Earth. Others may seem somewhat more exotic. But however you look at it, insects are a part of the wide range of ingredients that will be eaten in the future, especially given the fact that traditional food production systems and consumption patterns aren't what they used to be. 
Crocodiles are another alternative source of food for the future. Recent studies have shown that crocodile meat, from head to toe, offers numerous nutritional assets. It has less cholesterol than chicken, for example, and is especially beneficial for the formation and maintenance of human bone and muscle. Crocodile farms in Australia and several Asian countries serve up exquisitely cut fillets, ribs, and even sirloin steaks. There are also plenty of studies on the nutritional benefits of kangaroo meat. In fact, they are just as convincing. The consumption of less cholesterol would almost certainly reduce cardiovascular disease on a grand scale worldwide. Frankly, a change of eating habits with respect to animal proteins is probably imminent. It will certainly depend on us overcoming certain cultural prejudices that keep us from trying a fine ostrich steak or a nutritional plate of fried grasshoppers. But many of us will. The next revolution in the field of human sustenance will probably come from the sea. Without a doubt, the ocean's resources are enormous. The problem is that we've exploited the Earth's water for so long in such an irrational manner that many of its species are in danger of becoming extinct. We learned how to harness the land's resources some 10,000 years ago. That's how agriculture and animal husbandry came about. However, when it comes to the sea, we are still essentially predators. And the fact is, all the progress we've made in the field of fishing techniques have been aimed precisely at increasing our ability to prey on desired species. Thus, we are at the mercy of natural reproductive cycles and the nurturing of the marine animals we eat. And in the end, this is actually a great inconvenience. But if we can harness marine food sources with the same skill that we have harnessed land food sources, we could almost guarantee the advent of the day when hunger on a worldwide scale would disappear. In fact, aquaculture, ocean ranching if you will, might be the greatest challenge for humans looking for viable sources of food for the 21st century. In 100 years, it's estimated that 70.8% of the entire aquatic surface on planet Earth will be the primary source of our protein. That means we are soon to be witness to a development of historical proportions, something we might call the Blue Revolution. These gilthead bream are raised in captivity. At first, they are fed zooplankton and artemia, a tiny crustacean often used in aquaculture. During their enlarging period, they are basically fed dried pellets of fish meal. These fish are put on the market weighing between 300 and 500 grams and carry a guarantee assuring they contain the same nutritive value as their natural free-swimming counterparts. Aquaculture has filled a small yet important niche in humanity's nutritional needs for some time now. The cultivation of mussels, oysters and clams, for example, is a well-established industry. But cultivating fish species, well, that's a whole other kettle of fish. The Japanese were the first to delve into the wonders of aquaculture. 
Around the mid-20th century, they began cultivating the seriola from the tuna family, which is quickly becoming more and more common in markets around the world. Initial attempts did not properly take into account this species' natural maturation cycles. Japanese breeders relied on young specimens caught at sea, which they would then cultivate and send to market once they reached a weight of around four kilos or so. This process was carried out in coastal waters over a period of several months. Currently, the amount of fish bred in this and similar ways increases by about 20 tons per year, a rate that doesn't even remotely threaten traditional commercial fishing. The world's fishing fleets will continue to provide capture levels that aquaculture companies simply cannot compete with. But the world's aquaculture output is closing in slowly but surely. If its total contribution of marine protein to the world's diet is now 25 percent, it shouldn't be too long before it's 50 percent. However, it can't totally replace fishing on a worldwide scale. Supposing that aquaculture techniques continue their steady advance, experts predict that traditional fishing methods will be superfluous by 2090. At that point, 100% of marine nutrients will come from aquatic farms. But before turning the oceans into the industrial powerhouses we imagine they can become, we'll have to solve a few pesky problems among them, somehow managed to reproduce all the different fish species in captivity. Fish are egg layers. They reproduce by laying million and millions of eggs, of which only a few actually become fish. And the fact is, the circumstances under which newborn fish must paddle or perish are nothing short of precarious. Fish are extremely delicate creatures, they lack nutritional reserves, and are very sensitive to external factors such as water temperature, salinity, or acidity. You might even say that what's really exceptional is that any of them survive at all. But of course, that's precisely why females lay so many eggs. The situation is much easier on land, where animal offspring have a much higher probability of survival. Marine biologists have been working for years in an attempt to solve these challenges. At this point, the complete cultivation cycle has been solved for several species, such as salmon, sea bass, gilthead bream, and turbot. However, cultivation conditions still oscillate within incredibly narrow margins, where even the slightest environmental variation might cause total havoc. Raising little fish is difficult because we don't know exactly what they eat. There are other problems, too. This is a very complicated process, such as the tank conditions for the offspring, the water quality, and the amount of light they receive. At present, red bream and sole are fairly easy to breed, but it took over 10 years of in-depth studies to achieve this. First, we discovered what type of food to give them. And from that point, we established water conditions, overall environment, and the luminosity they needed for reproduction. Japan is also the seaweed country. Many of the most succulent dishes in several Asian cuisines are made with one or more of the many varieties of algae cultivated off oriental shores. While they are not yet of great gastronomic interest in the West, algae have all the requirements of an excellent food source for the future.
They are nutritious, easy to harvest, and very abundant. They alone could offset with enormous impact the food needs of practically any hungry human population. We aren't able to take full advantage of the ocean's tremendous possibilities because, to a large extent, we don't know how they work. The basis of marine life is phytoplankton, a kind of floating concentration of microscopic algae that is rich in protein and other nutrients and needs light to carry out photosynthesis. Phytoplankton is eaten by zooplankton, miniature crustaceans which are in turn the principal sustenance of small fish like sardines, mackerels and herrings, and also by large marine mammals such as whales. It's no coincidence that the greater part of all marine life is found in only 3% of the planet's water, the area where there is light. But what would happen if we managed to fill the other 97% of the oceans with nutrients? In 1988, the late John Martin of California posited that, since the lack of iron was the limiting factor regarding the growth of algae on the ocean's surface, why not spread iron in the water and foment spectacular growth? In May of 1995, his experiment was carried out in the Pacific Ocean. Iron was put in the water, and lo and behold, the algae population bloomed like never before. So these are samples from our enrichment experiment. Um, initially, the sample was very low in phytoplankton and zooplankton. And then as we added iron and as time passed, we had a phytoplankton bloom. It's greener. And um, you can see that it, it was really uh, abundantly growing. Iron is required for many enzyme systems in, in plants in the ocean. Just as iron is required to carry blood or oxygen in our blood, iron is also required uh, for phytoplankton to take up nutrients and uh, to carry electrons to build uh, chlorophyll for their systems. Um, and only tiny amounts are needed. Um, our experiments indicate that when tiny amounts of iron are added to the oceans, uh, it, it does increase plant production. Sowing the seas with iron, increasing life, and as a consequence, obtaining more food. The world's seas and oceans currently produce some 150 million tons of phytoplankton. Another way of raising that figure would be to increase the amount of light reaching the water. Illuminating the subaquatic world with powerful reflectors to facilitate chlorophyll production in plants that live hidden away in the depths. Obtaining the means necessary to put an operation of this type into practice would not be all that complicated. Then again, it wouldn't be all that profitable either, at least not in the short term. But perhaps sometime in the future, around the middle of this promising 21st century, maybe we will have managed to figure out a system to extract from the oceans the boundless potential of marine resources we surely will need.
the beginning of the 20th century, we lived on a planet of some 1.6 billion people. Today, there are over 6 billion of us. In the year 2050, there will be 10 billion. We'll have to consume some 500 million kilos of protein every day. Half of that will be animal protein. The rest will come from plants. By then, it is thought, we will have more than sufficient means to adequately feed the world's entire population. We will have developed numerous varieties of genetically modified products available to one and all. We will be duly served by efficient procedures designed to control these products, both medical and environmental in nature. We will have food that, besides satisfying our nutritional needs, will also provide us with specific personalized elements that will assuage individual health concerns. We will have land-based farms for raising animals that will offer us tasty, healthy products. From the seas and oceans, we will reap a boundless quantity of protein. Enormous floating marine ranches, protected by invisible security systems based, perhaps, on ultrasound. Arthur C. Clarke, the celebrated and visionary science fiction writer, once said that the herds of future aqua ranches would probably be made up of whales. Naturally, he said this based on solid reasoning. Whales are extremely useful animals. Their meat is just as tasty, or arguably even more so, than any conventional land animals. And since they're mammals, reproduction would be much less complicated than with the species tended currently. Raising whales would allow us to bypass several steps in the fish breeding chain, for baby whales feed on zooplankton right from birth. As with cattle, the commercial farming of whales would also be a definitive way of avoiding their extinction. As fate would have it, we might never be as close to the sea as in coming decades. Expectations are only as great as the imagination permits. It wouldn't be unrealistic even to expect humans to colonize the oceans. In fact, underwater cities, floating communities like those imagined by Jules Verne, are not that outlandish an idea. The sea is a world we have yet to rationally exploit. Is humanity about to close a circle? We are certainly on the verge of returning to where our amphibian ancestors once lived long ago. As with all of life's fabric, the future of food will also be woven with threads from the past. Recent food crises have hit hard. They won't be forgotten easily. That's why we won't ever stop trying to develop means for better, safer food for everyone. Humanity's many abilities put new techniques and possibilities at our fingertips. Taking advantage of them for the good of our species before we reach the physical limits of our planet is unquestionably one more crucially important test.